Coming up on today's Two on Your Side Town Hall, help for restaurants. A proposal today would send some their way, but is it enough? And what about the restrictions they're still facing? We're going to talk with the State Restaurant Association about all of that. Plus, a question for the Verify team as the Senate got a step closer to the start of former President Trump's second impeachment trial today. And planning pandemic vacations, we'll talk about what's different this year as we deal with this ongoing health crisis. Thanks so much for being here, everybody. I'm Kate Wellshofer. Michael has the night off, and we are going to begin tonight with a focus on restaurants, starting with a proposal in Albany aimed at helping them after a really rough 10 months. Senate Republicans presented a bill today that would, quote, reset the state's restaurant and hospitality industries. Among the proposals in the bill, it would exempt small businesses for one year from having to pay higher unemployment insurance for COVID-related layoffs. It would keep delivery services like DoorDash and Grubhub from charging any fees higher than they did last March. And small businesses would get more time to pay taxes to the state, as well as a 90-day grace period to pay any fines. And we to talk about all this and more, we're welcoming back Melissa Fleischut, President and CEO of the New York State Restaurant Association. Melissa, thanks so much for coming back. Thank you for having me. So we just went over that proposal briefly from state Senate Republicans today, and we should note that the Republicans are not in control of the state Senate. So typically that means an uphill battle as far as actually getting the bill to a vote. But still, we are wondering, are these proposals helpful and would it be enough? They are helpful. Um, there's a lot in this package, um, a lot of new ideas that we haven't seen before. Um, so I think that having the conversation about um, what they think is going to help the industry. Um, Senator Borello is one of the senators behind this package. He is a restaurant owner. So I do think they have a good sense of what the industry needs. And um, getting the dialogue going uh, early in the session is certainly going to help us move forward on a lot of these proposals. Um, is it enough? You know, I think we've talked about this numerous times. We need everybody uh, helping as much as they possibly can. So grateful uh, for, for these proposals, but sure, we need more. We still need additional funding at the federal level. We still need the Restaurants Act. When you say some newer ideas, what are some things that caught your ear that you thought this is something that is a little bit different that we haven't heard before that we could really use? Um, I think that, you know, we had fought hard for the uh, employee retention tax credit at the federal level, but hadn't really talked about it at the state level. So that was uh, a neat idea that we hadn't seen before. Um, 90 day grace periods on penalties and fines that are owed by uh, restaurant businesses. That's that's certainly helpful. Um, I think there was some interest free loans in there and lines of credit which haven't really been um, put forward before. So that was really interesting. An additional time to pay taxes certainly helps the industry. And Empire State Development put out its own aid program three weeks ago, offering $5,000 grants for restaurants for changes they had to make for the pandemic. Based on the owners you've talked to, how far is five grand going to go for them? And do you foresee any more help coming in from Albany? Yeah, I mean, $5,000, you know, helps to get you through maybe another week. Um, but, you know, it's it's not enough to be sustainable at this point. Like I said, we need everybody working together to, to try and save the industry and to help us as much as they possibly can. Um, for those people who, you know, are receiving those $5,000 grants, I'm sure they're grateful and I'm sure that helps them out. Um, but it's not something that would, you know, really bridge us until the vaccine is um, widely, widely spread at this point. To hear you say a week certainly gives perspective for those of us who are not in the industry and may not understand fully just what it takes. Um, and you know, time and time again, when we talk to business owners, this conversation comes back to the restrictions in the state, right? And a lawsuit here in Western New York did lead to indoor dining being restored somewhat for restaurants in the so-called orange zones. Another suit now is taking aim at the statewide 10 p.m. closing time. If that suit is also successful, do you think that'll satisfy restaurant owners for now? Or are there other restrictions that they may still consider to be unreasonable and want to take on uh, in court? 
Um, you know, there's been a number of lawsuits across the time of the pandemic um, suing over different things. So I think there's still a number of issues with the restrictions. I know for our New York City members, reopening is obviously the priority for them. Um, for our catering members, they're looking at the gathering limit, um, the idea that they can't dance at weddings or events of that nature it seems to be a big sticking point as well. But the curfew, um, uh, we hear that from all different types of businesses across the state, our bars, our restaurants, our caterers. Um, universally, they would like to see that extended at least till midnight if we can, can do that. Um, and we put out our own statement on that on Saturday, asking for that to, to be extended as well. So there's still a, a couple little things I think that the you know, restrictions really are, are hurting some sections of the industry. And we know that the impact of the pandemic has been devastating on the restaurant industry. And, and certainly you've been here to talk about that along the way. But can you put into perspective what kind of numbers that we're talking about 10 months later now? Do we even know how many businesses have had no other choice but to make that hard decision and say we have to close for good, we just can't continue on? So the numbers that we've seen so far have come from the National Restaurant Association on the national level, and they believe that one in six restaurants has permanently closed due to the pandemic um, and during the past 10 months. Um, I think it's a little hard to tell right now, especially with New York City still closed for indoor dining. Um, we've seen restaurants sort of do this hibernation model over the winter where they've closed down for several months and plan to reopen in um, February or March or maybe even April. But until we see them really reopen, um, you know, it's hard to know if it's temporary or permanent at this point. We've been chatting with Melissa Fleischut. She's the president and CEO of the New York State Restaurant Association. Melissa, thanks again for being here. Thank you. Well, also tonight, after the House of Representatives delivered articles of impeachment to the Senate, senators were sworn in today to try former President Trump in the impeachment trial two weeks from today. So it's a complicated process that has led to a lot of questions for the Verify team, and Evan Kozlov is looking at one of those for us tonight. Politics can be messy and misinformation is everywhere. That's why the Verify team goes to the vetted experts to get you the facts. Debbie from West Virginia asked us this, quote, if Donald Trump's trial for impeachment starts after he's out of office, is he responsible for his own legal fees or do taxpayers bear the burden? So let's verify. Do our tax dollars pay for President Trump's legal fees? And what about the rest of the impeachment trial? Here are our sources. Robert Peck from the Center for Constitutional Litigation, Paul Schiff Berman from the George Washington University Law School, and Stephen Ellis from Taxpayers for Common Sense, which is a spending watchdog. Let's start with Trump's legal fees. The public official being impeached does not have a right to have the government pay for it. He has to pay for uh, his defense out of his own money. No taxpayer dollars are going to go to paying President Trump's legal fees. And our experts explain that this was also the case during the first impeachment trial. President Trump's attorney fees were not covered by taxpayers. Last time around, it was the Republican National Committee that raised the funds. Uh, it's possible that they're doing so again. So we could verify that no. Taxpayers are not on the hook for President Trump's legal fees. As for all the other costs related to the impeachment, our experts say it's mostly covered already. That's because members of Congress, senators, and all their staff are covered by salaries. But really, the only cost will be senators' sleep time. The House Judiciary Committee did bring on two lawyers on a consulting basis, but our tax expert says that will be paid out of the operations account. The funding is all pretty, it's all baked in. It's not like they're having to uh, grab extra cash to, to do this. From here at the Capitol, this is Evan Kozlov with your Verify. Thank you, Evan. If you have something you want us to verify, we want to hear from you. You can get in touch on social media, send an email to verify at WGRZ.com or message the text to line 849-2200. And we know a lot of you are feeling frustrated and discouraged that 10 months in now, we're still dealing with all the pandemic has to offer. The vaccine has given us some hope. And Dr. Anthony Fauci told NBC's Richard Engel that there's more of that to come. We have had challenges of infectious diseases that have had the capability of eluding us. But we have won, so I think we can do the same with this virus. But when we won against those massive challenges in the past, it seems like there was a more concerted effort. And that's what happens, unfortunately, when you have broadly and generally 
the demand is now exceeding the supply. Even though in some outlier places, it looks like it's the opposite, where there's vaccine that is not being expeditiously utilized. But in general, we have 360 mil, excuse me, 330 million people in this country, and we want to vaccinate at least 280 million of those. Richard, we don't have right now 280 million doses of vaccine ready to go. If we had 280 million doses of vaccine ready to go, then roll out the trucks, go and open up the auditoriums and the stadiums and do it. But we don't have that right now. So we have to deal with what we have. 